Hey New Culture Church, my name is Alyssa Lee and I'm a missionary at the University of Wisconsin-Madison with Chi Alpha Christian Community and a part of New Culture Church. We're so happy that you could join us on this Sunday at New Culture Church Online Church at Home. If you're joining from a house church, welcome. If you're joining from your own living room, we want to welcome you as well. I just wanted to give you guys a quick rundown of what's going to be happening at New Culture Church Online today. First, I'm just going to share a couple of announcements with you and then that'll be followed by a short time of prayer. And then we'll have a message and we'll have some worship. You might have worship um, live right there for you if you're attending a house church or otherwise we'll be posting a worship set for you following the service to enjoy some worship at home. The first announcement I have for you tonight is about welcome night. We're gonna be having a welcome night if you have recently started attending New Culture Church. We would love to see you in person at Wilmar Community Center at 7 p.m. on August 30th. Welcome night is a time for you to get to know a few other people in New Culture as well as a time for us to get to know you and share more information about New Culture and how you can be involved. The next announcement I have for you tonight is about water baptisms. We're going to be having a water baptism service on Sunday, September 13th. If that's something that you are interested in doing, if you'd like to take that step in your walk with Jesus, please go to newculturechurch.com slash connect and fill out the form to sign up. Pastor Abby will be connecting with you shortly after filling out that form to share more with you about water baptism and about what that service will look like. The next announcement I have for you is, if you have recently started attending New Culture Church and haven't yet filled out our connect form, we would love for you to do that so that we can get to know you better and also know how we can pray for you. Please go to newculturechurch.com slash connect to fill out our connect form. At that link, you'll also find a place to RSVP for house churches. We have house churches that meet every Sunday to watch the service together and also have some discussion afterwards. We also have a community that meets online. We would love to get you connected to one of these communities. Thank you so much for filling out our connect form. One of the best ways that we love to show our worship to God is through our giving. Um, we have these things called tithes and offerings, which is giving of the things that we have um, back to God. And if you head to newculturechurch.com slash give, you are able to give um, whatever you would like to, to see this ministry continue to reach the city of Madison and bring the culture of Jesus here. So I'm just going to take a moment to pray over our tithes and offerings today. God, we just thank you so much um, for just showing us what it looks like to give. Um, God, you gave your son to us. You gave everything. You gave things um, that just meant so incredibly much to you. And I pray um, that you would just inspire us to do the same and to hold the things that we've been given and the things that we've been blessed with loosely. Um, God, and just allow you to move in our lives and to um, disperse what we've received um, the way that according to your plan. And so I just thank you so much, God. I thank you that everything in this earth truly does belong to you and pray that um, whatever is given would truly be blessed and would be used according to your will. And it's in your name we pray, God. Amen. Up next is the message. If you are watching online, we would love to hear from you today. So please be sure and drop a greeting in the comments so that we know you're watching, we know you're listening, and we can feel like we're all in this together. Hey, New Culture, Abby here, and I'm so excited to dive in the word with you today. So the past couple weeks, we've been able to hear from Nate Lee and Nathan Hanna as we've been walking through the book of Acts, and both of them just did such a phenomenal job teaching on 
um, just the life of the early church and the people that were involved. And so one of the things that we've been doing over the past couple weeks is we've been starting to look more at some of the individual stories of the people whose lives were completely transformed by the gospel and that God used to build his church and multiply his kingdom through. Now, I love looking at some of these stories more as individuals because I think a lot of times we, we can talk about these characters and we talk about these people and they're like these biblical heroes. Like they truly are heroes of the faith. Um, but it's kind of cool when you get to learn a little bit more about their backstory and who they are. And so today we're going to be reading Acts chapter 9. So if you have the YouVersion Bible app, you can go ahead and search under events for New Culture Church. You're going to find notes from today's message, the scriptures that we're going to be reading through, and it will just be a great way for you to follow along. So um, if you're watching at home, watching at a house church, welcome, encourage you, follow along on the Bible app. So today we're talking about Paul. Now I love Paul. Paul. Paul is probably one of the most famous people in the Bible. He wrote the majority of the New Testament. Um, one of the things about Paul is that before he was Paul the Apostle, before he was Paul the Preacher, he was Paul the Persecutor. See, Paul was known first for persecuting Christians and those who believed in the gospel before he was known for preaching the gospel. So talk about a crazy life transformation here that we witness take Place. So just to give us a little bit of background today, I have a quick video that we're going to play that will help you just understand a little bit more the life of Paul. There was a mean man chasing after Jesus' followers. His name was Saul. He was sure that everything people were saying about Jesus was wrong. He didn't believe Jesus had risen from death. He was so sure he was right that he hurt and even killed people who believed in Jesus. Well, guess what? God wanted Saul to work for him and spread the news of Jesus. So one day, when Saul was on a journey, God sent a bright flash of light. It was so bright that Saul fell to the ground. Saul, why are you doing things against me? Who are you? I am Jesus. Now get up and go into the city. When Saul stood up, he was blind. His friends had to lead him into the city. Saul wouldn't eat or drink anything for three days. God sent a man named Ananias to find Saul and pray for him so that Saul could see again. Ananias was scared of Saul, but he believed in Jesus and went anyway. Ananias prayed for Saul. And Saul's sight came back. On that day, God changed Saul's heart to make him kind to those who believed in Jesus. After that, Saul was called Paul, and he began to tell others about Jesus, too, and became the greatest missionary of all time.
right, so hopefully after watching that, you're a little bit up to speed as we have heard Paul mentioned already in the book of Acts. So we first start to hear his story. Nate talked a couple weeks how Paul was actually the one that went ahead and said, yes, go ahead, stone Stephen. And you can go back if you didn't hear that message on our YouTube channel, on our Facebook to watch. But Paul was there and he witnessed Stephen give this entire sermon where Stephen was preaching the gospel. He's talking about Moses. He's talking about Jesus. And he ultimately is martyred for his faith just like follows Jesus' example all the way through and laying down his life for the gospel. Now, um, Nathan shared some statistics last week about millennial Christians that I wanted to share again because I just thought they were so good. So he shared that 96% of millennial Christians would agree that sharing Jesus is a part of their faith. It's good. 94% would say that knowing Jesus is the best thing that could ever happen to someone, but only 47% of millennial Christians feel it's wrong um, to share Jesus with someone with a different worldview. Um, so it's a much smaller number there. So I hope you're kind of catching that there, right? So so like 96%, so that's almost like all millennial Christians, if they follow, or if they're followers of Jesus, they would say that, um, yeah, like I think I share Jesus. And then it goes down just a little bit to 94% and they're like, Jesus, knowing Jesus is the best thing that could happen to you. It's still kind of crazy to me that it's not 100% if you're following Jesus to say this is the best thing. But then it drops way, way down where it says 47% of millennial Christians feel it's wrong to share Jesus with someone with a different worldview. Now let's think back to the life of Paul. So we look Paul. Paul was someone that persecuted Christians. Then we see that he comes and he meets Jesus. And we're going to read about this more in scripture here. Um, but before he met Jesus, he had to have heard the gospel. He had to have had somebody show him or talk to him about Jesus. Now, what I love about Paul's conversion story is that what we read here in Acts chapter 9 in this text, that this isn't the story in totality, that this isn't the whole story of Paul's life being transformed, but it's just one moment. And, and we know that when the Holy Spirit comes and he speaks to us and he moves, he uses these moments to then turn them into these movements, right? He takes a moment and he turns it into a movement. And that's what you see in the life of Paul is he multiplies this moment over and over in his life. But before Paul gets here in scripture, you see that he watched Stephen give his life for the gospel. Now, these statistics can be hard because even last week at House Church, I know um, in the House Church that I attend at Wilmar, we were talking about how sometimes right now we're fully aware that being a Christian, when you say I'm a Christian, can mean a lot of things to people. So to some people, they already can assume your political party. They can assume your stance on Black Lives Matter. They can assume your, your stance on abortion and all these different things. People have all these assumptions when you say you're a Christian. People can often assume that you're going to hate them because they live differently than you. People are, are going to assume that, that you are going to talk negatively about them or that you're going to be against them. There's all these assumptions that come with saying, I am a Christian. And that's why a lot of people, you know, I'm sometimes has, I'm like, I want to say like, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, right? Like I follow Jesus. I'm not just this religious person, but I follow a person and, and I follow Jesus. And it can be hard if we're being completely honest to identify with the church right now when a lot, for many years, the church has not been doing the greatest job when it comes to loving people, caring for people, fighting for the minorities, fighting for justice, for biblical social justice. Like the church just hasn't always done the greatest job. And so for a lot of us now, um, whether you fall into this millennial Christian age range or not, you kind of read this and you're like, well, yeah, it, it can be hard to share my faith. With, with someone with a different worldview because we don't want to offend them. We don't want to upset them. But but as I start to think about this and we start to see see how Paul lived his life is that Paul wouldn't have known Jesus and if he had never heard of Jesus, right? Like if nobody tells you, how will you ever know about the best relationship in your life, about something that completely changed your life? And so I want you to think about, last week Nathan challenged us, he said, will you think of a few people in your life that are far from Jesus, whether in your workplace, family members that you can be praying for, you can be reaching out for. And I want you to think of those people, um, people that have such a different worldview 
than you do. What would happen if nobody ever told them about Jesus? What would happen? But I want you to take it a step further. What would happen if you told them about Jesus, but you never looked like Jesus? You never lived like Jesus. You see, I think that one of the reasons that Paul finally got to this point where he was able to fully surrender his life to Jesus was not just because somebody said, hey, John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Like, that's a great verse. That is true. Like, whoever believes in him will have eternal life. But I don't think that Paul came to know Jesus just because of that one, somebody just saying that to him, but because he was able to witness people being martyred for this faith. Him, He himself killed people who said that they followed the way. They followed Jesus. And so I'm getting ahead of myself here, so I'm going to jump into the text really quick. Starting in Acts 9, in verse 1, it says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? All right, I love Paul. I love this story. I love this text. Uh, so we're going to be talking about him for quite a few weeks. He's all over the book of Acts, all over the New Testament. But but I, I, I want you to catch here, like, Paul himself, he was going around, and at this time his name's still Saul, so sorry, I'm going to jump around here, but, but he was still killing Christians. So he witnessed people that were so committed to Jesus that they were willing to give their lives for the sake of the gospel. So he didn't just get to hear about the Messiah, but he got to see people that were in the process of becoming like him, that they too were willing to lay down every part of who they were for the sake of his kingdom come. So I want you to hear this today, that when it comes to those people that we're looking at and we're saying, would you, would they ever come to know Jesus? Like, it, it, maybe you're in that spot watching this and you're like, would Jesus ever want someone like me? Uh, I don't know if you could you could get any farther from Jesus than where Paul was. Like if we're if we're we're looking at the Bible and we're like, what are some of the most terrible things you can do? Like he was probably doing them. Like he was killing, murdering people. He's literally going around and he's saying, I don't care if it's a woman, I don't care if it's a man. And at that time, right, like for him to say that he was willing to kill a woman, like that was so extreme. And so he's going around and he's saying, like, I don't care. Like if they're followers of the way, which is referring to Jesus, we know that he said that I'm the way, the truth, and the light. Like he is the road, he's the journey, like he's it, he is the way. So he's saying if anybody uh, belongs to the way, if they're, if they're following the way, like I'm coming for them. This is where he's at. And that is when all of a sudden the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, meets him in this dream and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? I want you to catch here that when Saul was as far as you could get from following the way, the Holy Spirit shows up and meets him right there in that moment. Now, I've been thinking a lot about this when it comes to um, just some of the some of the injustices that we've witnessed over this summer, right? I've been thinking about how each and every person is created in the image of God, and how when we witness um, people mistreat other people, like we have this summer, okay? The cops who killed George Floyd, and it's it's hard, right? Like you're angry, you're upset, you're furious, heartbroken, grieving, all of these emotions. That, that we've been feeling through this summer. And I think, God, you created those people in your image. Even the ones that are hurting people and mistreating them, you created them in your image. And I start to think of, if we believe God is who he says he is, and that if he could take someone like Paul and he could completely transform his life from being someone that was persecuting and a murderer to someone that was a pastor, a preacher, and a messenger... Do I think that that God is still alive today? Do I think that he can completely transform the hearts of those people that are mistreating others that are image bearers right now today? 
And I start to think about the people that I know, not just through a distance that I've seen on TV or I've seen in some of these videos who, who are saying just horrendous things and, and who are acting so ungodly and so far from Jesus. Like, do we as the church have that type of faith and boldness where we say, God, we believe that you can transform their lives. We believe that even those people that are far from you, you want a relationship with them. So how do we get to that point where we see it? I think it's going to take us using our words and proclaiming the gospel boldly, but I also think it's going to take us living our lives. Like, are we living like Jesus? Are, are, are we not only verbally fighting against injustice, but, but are we practically in our everyday lives, are we looking to make a difference in our world? Like, where do you spend your free time? Are, are there places that you're volunteering? Are there places that you're giving of your finances to that, that are fighting for, for, for justice here in our city and in our neighborhoods and in our community? Because I think it's one thing for us to say, yes, we believe in Jesus and we believe in the power of his gospel, but it's another thing for us to live it. You see, for Stephen and for many of the apostles who literally Paul, like, took some, he, part of them, he took their lives, like, he was the one that took their lives. He witnessed them being willing to give up everything. And I feel like right now God's asking some of us, he's like, hey, it might not be your physical life, but, like, would you give up a Saturday to go volunteer somewhere? Would you give up um, um, maybe going out to eat for a meal so that you could instead give to people who don't have food to eat? Right? Like, there's different ways that that looks for different people at different times. But when you think of one of the ways that Paul, this person that was far, far from Jesus, like, we would all be bashing him on social media. Paul would have been canceled before cancel culture was ever a thing. That's who Paul was. Yet, Jesus came through the power of his Holy Spirit. He met him where he was at. He transformed his life. And Paul goes on to be an incredible messenger and tool for multiplying the kingdom. Why? Because he not only heard the gospel, but he saw the gospel come to life. Are we living out the gospel in our daily lives? Are we sacrificing? Are we surrendering? Are we following the way in all ways of our life? So we keep reading in verse 5. It says, Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And, and it says, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they laid him by the hand into Damascus. They led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink. So cool to see, once again, like our God, God of the supernatural. And it says, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he said. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias said, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem, and he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said, Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Wow. I love this so much, and there's so much to unpack here when it talks about this. But I want you to think about um, the two things that we're seeing here, right? And this isn't the first time that we see God speak through dreams, and it's not the last time, right? God can still do that right here, right now, today. But you see here that Jesus appears to Paul in this dream, and he's saying, go to Ananias. And, and Paul's someone far from Jesus. Ananias, it says he's a disciple, so he's someone close to Jesus. He receives this dream, and, and Jesus is telling him, like, this man is, like, coming. You're going to lay your hands on him. You're going to meet him. I'm ready to transform his life. And he's saying, like, essentially, hey, I've heard about this man. I've heard the things he's done. And in a way, it's almost like he's coming at God, and he's like, are you sure? Are you sure you're, we're talking about the same person here? Like, do you know this man? Do you know what he's capable of? And Jesus is in it, sitting there. He's like, yes, yes. Like, I know. I know who Saul is, and I know who he's going to become. But I think for a lot of us today, we might be in the Saul spot, right? Like, you might be watching this, and you might be someone where you're far from Jesus, and maybe you've made mistakes that you're like, I don't know, God, like, 
would you ever want me? And the answer to that today is yes. Yes, he wants you. Yes, he sees who you are now. He sees who you've been and he sees who you're going to become. That's how great our God is. And he wants you to become a follower of him. He wants you to continue to walk closely with him. And he wants you to not walk in that shame, but to leave that behind and to walk with this new vision. You see, Paul was completely blind and it's almost in this way that God gave him this new sight. And, and that's the power of transformation. Like God wants to continue to renew our vision and make it stronger and make it clear so we can start to see the world through his eyes. So there's no shame in, in, in your past mistakes. There's no shame in what you've done before, but know that God sees you right now and he sees who you're going to become. He says, will you repent and will you come and will you follow me? But then for a lot of us, I think we're more have the heart of Ananias. Where when God's saying, hey, you see this person over here who I'm getting ready to move in their life. I'm getting ready to do something powerful. And, and we're coming at God and we're going, are you sure? Are you sure you want that person? I want you to think right now of someone in your life that you feel like it would be impossible for them to ever come to know Jesus. Maybe maybe they're an atheist. Maybe they're agnostic. Maybe they have straight up told you, I have no desire to ever follow Jesus. How would you respond today if they came knocking on your door and they said, hey, I'm ready. Can I come to house church with you next week? But, but I want you to think of this too. What if then you're like, yes, that's fine, but their, their life still didn't look like it was following Jesus? What if the transformation is an instant? Like we kind of read here in scripture, it goes on that it seems like his transformation was, was like a complete 180, right? So he goes from killing Christians, he goes from persecuting to preaching. He goes from murdering to being this powerful messenger. And it seems like it was pretty instant for him. And, and it's always hard to know for sure. Like, hey, was there more time? Like, did he go away and come back? Like, I don't know. There's a lot here in scripture to dive into. But for the most part, it seems like it was this pretty 180 transformation. But can I tell you, like, it doesn't always happen that way. So what about the people in our lives where they say, hey, I want to follow Jesus, but then they're still doing things that you might not think looks like Jesus. How are you going to respond to that? As we're on this process of becoming like Jesus, how do we do that in a way that people are so drawn to that? But part of that is accepting other people on their journey of following Jesus. And that doesn't mean that, that, that we don't try to encourage them to, to live more like Jesus, but it also says, are we willing to welcome them in even if they don't follow what, the way that we think that they should be following or do the things that we think they should be doing right away? I love in verse 17, it says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he would see he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. So we see here in, in this passage that it's two-part, right? So not only is it Saul being obedient, but it's Ananias being obedient to say, like, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus sent me. He was willing to go to somebody that most Christians would have said they are untouchable. I can't think of many people at that time that would have wanted to go to Saul, who was known for killing Christians, and say, the Lord sent me. Think about that. Think about how scary that must have been to be Ananias. He too was willing to give up his life, potentially, for the sake of being obedient. But what we see happens is that instead, Paul lays down his life completely, where it says, immediately, something like scales fell from his eyes. And then he went, he repented of his sins, and he was baptized. Now, God's pretty cool because I didn't even plan this, um, but in a few weeks, we're doing our first baptisms at New Culture, and um, this week just happened to be talking about Paul and how he was baptized. And one of the greatest things about baptism, about baptism is, is such a celebration of us proclaiming the good news and celebrating the decision that we've made to follow Jesus. And so I um, wanted to share a little bit today of, of just the power in that. Um, and so if you're watching this, and maybe some of you, you've never been baptized, I want to encourage you to pray about um, taking that step and, and to get baptized. Because we see that Jesus, 
he was baptized right before he walked into ministry. He was baptized in water. And um, we see that then all throughout scripture, believers, they're baptized. Once they say yes to following Jesus, they follow Jesus' example by stepping into that water and proclaiming him as Lord and Savior. And, and, and so when people go under and uh, the water there, they're signifying that they are being buried with Christ. And when they're raised back out of the water in this full body submersion, it's saying, God, I'm giving you everything. I fully surrender that I'm willing to be buried with Christ and raised to walk with him in new life. And so we're going to be celebrating that September 13th. And if you've never been baptized, or maybe you were when you were super young and you had no idea what it meant, I want to encourage you that if you are a follower of Jesus and you've said yes to surrendering everything to him, get baptized. Take that step of obedience. That for Paul, that was something he did right away. And then I love that after this, as it continues, it says, took some food, he regained his strength. And then right in the verse in like 21, 22, it talks about that he spent some time with the disciples. And again, like, I want you to think about how powerful this is. Because not only are we reading about the power of Paul's transformation, but we're also, real, like, reading about the power of the church at that time for accepting him. Think about how hard that would be for them to say, this is not someone that looks like us, that talks like us. But the reality was, the disciples, they knew, we've all been there. We all have stuff. We all have a past. We all have things that, that we are not proud of. Things that, that we wish that maybe people never knew about our lives. But as the church, we need to constantly remember where we've been, but also look to where we're going and how God sees us. And he sees us as whole. He sees us as complete. He sees us as his image bearers. And he so desperately longs to have relationship with you, with me, and for the people that we would least expect him to have relationship with. And so today, just in closing, I want you to kind of um, answer these questions for yourself of when we're talking about people that are far from Jesus. And last week, Nathan gave us the challenge to say, hey, will you pray for them? Will, will you invite someone to have a meal with? Will you share a meal with the body of believers? I want you to talk about that tonight with your house churches or with your people that you're watching with. Of who are those people in your life far from Jesus that you can be praying with and believing that even them, God can meet right where they're at. And then I want you to think of um, where in your heart do you need to make room to accept those people when they come? What are those things that maybe it's hard for you to watch other people live their life in this way? Uh, maybe it's things that you consider to be sin and other people you're looking at, you're like, don't you know, like that's sinful. Why are you doing that? And what are those things that you need to make room for to say, if that person came to know Jesus today and wanted to share a meal with me, how would I respond? So would you pray this week to say, God, who do I need to make room for? And, and continue to pray with that boldness that God, too, can transform their lives. Just how he took Paul from means that persecuted Christians for preaching the gospel. Someone that he himself preached the gospel. Let's pray for that transformation for the people in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our city. And if you're in a spot where, where you are saying, God, I, I want to know you and I feel unworthy. I just want to encourage you today. Would you say yes to that? Because no matter what you've done in your past... God cares way more about who you are as his child than he does about what you have done. And he wants more than anything to be with you and invite you in on that journey of becoming like him and doing what he did. If God can change someone from Paul and take him so far to close to him, surely he can do it for you. And I believe that today. And then I also want to challenge you that if you haven't been baptized yet, would you take that step of obedience? Um, just as Paul wasted no time, he says, yes, Lord, you're mine. Now I'm going to put this on display. I'm going to make a public declaration of this and a celebration. Would you do that? Um, and you can do that by going to newcultureschurch.com slash connect. On the connect form this week, there's a spot for you to say, hey, I want to get baptized. And so I want to encourage you, would you do that this week? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are so good. God, um, you're so powerful. Even just just thinking again today about the power of your transformation in Paul's life just gets me so excited to think of all the people around us that you you want to have a relationship with God, and not only can you do it, but you will do it. And so, Lord, I just ask for all of us right now that you would help us to open up our hearts to those people that you're getting ready to bring in. God, would we be able to walk in humility and not cast judgments um, and not cast the first stone, but to be willing and ready to invite people into our community and to build relationships with you. And God, I pray for any person, Lord, that is in this spot of, of taking that step to follow you. Would you, God, Lord, 
right now, would you just show them how much you love them right where they're at and how much you want a relationship with them and help them to take that bold step of laying down everything for the sake of your gospel. We love you, Lord. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Abby, for that great message. Now we're going to transition into a time of worship. Your worship may be live today if you're at a house church, or you're more than welcome to follow along with the worship set that we'll be posting on this video um, shortly after. We thank you so much for just joining us today, for being a part of New Culture Church Online, and we can't wait to see you next week. Mm -hmm.